Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Shanjun in Beijing. In today's program, we are continuing with our major series about Chinese civilization. In it, we set out to illustrate the evolution of Chinese civilization through an investigation of archaeological discoveries, historical sites, and cultural relics. Today, nearly 500 years after the end of the Ming Dynasty, its achievements continue to fascinate us. The colossal Yongle Bell, for example, actually ran in the new millennium. Then there's the Forbidden City. And let's not forget the legendary voyages of Zheng He to the Western Seas. During the Ming Dynasty, great achievements were recorded in architecture, shipbuilding, porcelain making, and textile weaving. Chinese-made products became famous around the known world for their high quality and sublime craftsmanship. Today, nearly 500 years after the end of the Ming Dynasty, its wonders continue to fascinate. There is the colossal Yongle Bell, which tolled in the year 2000 to celebrate the beginning of the new millennium. There are the golden glazed tiles in the Forbidden City that shine against Beijing's azure sky. And then there are the legendary voyages made by Zheng He to the Western Seas. During the Ming Dynasty, there were new achievements in architecture, shipbuilding, porcelain making, and textiles. Products made in China were already well known throughout the world for their high quality and supreme craftsmanship. But during the Ming Dynasty, Chinese technology was to reach an unprecedented level. In the process, adding yet more vibrant colors to the civilization of China and the world. Zheng He had brought more than 10,000 copies of books to give away in the hope of spreading Chinese civilization and traditional Confucian ideas. However, the items most welcomed everywhere were the beautiful silk and brocade pieces. 37 of the countries he visited received various types of Chinese silk and brocade. Most of the silk he took with him came from the south of China. The making of textiles had reached a peak, as could be seen in the fact that during the Ming Dynasty, textile making was the number one handicraft industry in almost every large or small town in the South. Of all the textile industries, however, silk weaving was number one.已经开始逐步的摆脱了这个一夫一妻的那种自然经济的那种纺织业一个人操作纺织业开始了一种比较大型的手工业的生产就手工工厂式的这种生产模式所以它能够有一定的批量和一定的质量保障至少我这一批的
Through Chinese silk and brocade, they did their best to imagine the mysterious kingdom in the east from which it had come. Silk weaving had matured in China 2,000 years before, during the Warring States period. Numerous silk products in a great variety of colors and embroidered in different ways have been unearthed from the tombs of that period. On October the 5th, 1957, archaeologists working on the inner and outer coffins of the Ming Emperor Wan Li had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see the very finest brocade made during the 16th and 17th centuries. Both the outer and inner coffins presented a showcase of the best silk and brocade products of the era, and the 300 years that had passed had taken no toll on their brilliance. All of the pieces were precious, but without doubt the most invaluable was the gown of Emperor Wan Li, which was unbelievably light in weight, extremely thin and highly transparent. Woven into the gown were the patterns of 17 dragons flying in clouds. The silk was of the highest quality imaginable, its threads very thin yet highly durable. In 1983, the Nanjing Brocade Institute was entrusted by the Dingling Mausoleum Museum to produce a replica of the gown. Even with the experience it had accumulated over the previous 30 years, it took the Nanjing Brocade Institute five years to accomplish the task. Chinese silk and brocade products had enjoyed tremendous popularity worldwide since the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago, right through to the Tang and Song Dynasties. But the Ming Dynasty pushed the silk-making technology of Song to another peak. In the early 18th century, British Navy medical workers found out what had caused the deaths of so many men under Magellan and Columbus on their famous voyages. It was scurvy, a malady caused by a lack of vitamin C. However, 80 years before Magellan and Columbus, Zheng He sailors had not suffered from a single case of this disease. But with them on their ships were porcelain containers in which they grew bean sprouts for consumption while on board. Bean sprouts are a rich source of vitamin C. After Zhang He's voyages, the countries he visited began to make Chinese porcelain. The Ming Dynasty truly was the golden age of porcelain making. Among all the kilns that made porcelain in China during the Ming Dynasty, Jing Dejian in Jiangxi, Meng Chuan in Zhejiang, De Hua in Fujian, Yu Xi and Jian Shui in Yunnan stood out, and each of them had their own specialties. Jing Dejian produced a complete range of products. Meng Chuan specialized in shadowy blue porcelain, in De Hua it was white porcelain, and in Yu Xi and Jian Shui, it was blue and white porcelain. Among the porcelain products Zheng He took with him, most came from Jing De Jian, and they were the best. In Jing De Jian, by the early Ming Dynasty, there were as many as 20 kilns producing porcelain for the exclusive use of the royal family. But apart from royal orders, a large amount of porcelain for the use of commoners was also produced in Jing De Jian. Workers in the town toiled day and night and the kiln fires blazed all year round. Some people called Jing Dejian a town of thunder and flashes of lightning. Every process in porcelain making was clearly defined, from the preparation of the clay to the final firing, and altogether there were a dozen or more steps. Each step was handled by only one person, the one most skilled in that process. This division of labor was something like a modern day assembly line. However, division of labor based on specialization and the use of an assembly line system did not hinder the artistic aspirations of the workers. Their works often revealed artistic leanings that were quite individual, proving that there was still some room for personal expression.
The Ming Dynasty was a golden age of porcelain making, when great advances were achieved in the production technology. Thanks to Zheng He and his voyages to the Western Seas, Chinese porcelain became famous throughout the world. From finds brought up from the bottom of the South China Sea, archaeologists have concluded that during the Ming Dynasty, the amount of porcelain exported to foreign countries reached a record high. A large number of merchants from Arabia, India, Portugal, the Netherlands and Britain could be seen doing porcelain business in China. The amount of porcelain exported to the Netherlands alone came to more than 16 million pieces.在雅加达经常有报纸上有登载中国瓷器的销售和拍卖特别是古瓷器的拍卖这表明在人民心目中是非常崇高的而且呢这个瓷器在有些庙宇里边当作神圣的这个物品来对待人们在瓷器面前
and in the years it was built, it was both the tallest building in the city of Beijing and the largest wooden construction in the world. The Hall of Supreme Harmony occupies an area of 2,381 square meters, half the size of a modern-day soccer field. The Hall of Supreme Harmony stands on an eight-meter-tall white marble base at the very center of the Forbidden City, and it is the climax of the palace complex. It not only mirrors the highest attainment of traditional Chinese architecture, but also embodies age-old Chinese philosophies. If one looked southward from the just completed Forbidden City, one would have seen another royal building complex under construction that was about the same size, the Temple of Heaven. Inside the grounds of the Temple of Heaven stands Qinian Hall, which means the Hall of Prayers for a Good Harvest. This magnificent structure includes 28 huge pillars of a kind of mahogany known as Nan Mu wood, along with wooden tiers, brackets and other parts joined together to form a wonderful whole. The arrangement of the pillars implies a profound meaning. The inner four suggest the four seasons of the year, the twelve in the middle stand for the twelve months of the year, and the outer twelve, the twelve periods of a day. Together, they represent the twenty-eight constellations of the universe. Magnificent in appearance and exquisite in detail, the inside of the hall shrinks to the center as the height increases, giving the building a stately demeanor as befits its purpose to elicit in the beholder an awesome respect for the power of heaven. This effect is enhanced by the solemn-looking eaves on top of the building and the round white marble stand at the bottom. The reputation of the Chinese products Zhang He took with him brought him considerable honor and made him welcome everywhere he visited. On his sixth voyage, he reached the African coast. There, 1,200 envoys from 16 African and Asian countries boarded his ships and returned with them to China. Back in Beijing, the Ming Emperor had to arrange for 40,000 rolls of silk and brocade to be collected from around the country to present as gifts to these foreign envoys. Among those who wanted to see the legendary civilization of China was the 28-year-old king of Borni. Unfortunately, however, after arriving in China, he fell seriously ill, and a couple of months later, he died. The Ming emperor honored him with the title Prince Gung Shuan, and in accordance with his wishes, he was buried in a suburb of Nanjing City. His tomb can still be seen there today. Even before the Ming Dynasty, China had been sending diplomatic missions overland to the West. For centuries, private trade had extended as far as East Africa. However, never before had a government-sponsored mission with the grandeur of Cheng He's fleet been organized. His voyages were a vivid demonstration of the economic and cultural prosperity of the Ming Dynasty. Zhang He's fifth voyage was a somewhat hurried affair, probably due to a grand ceremony held to commemorate the moving of the capital to Beijing, although this is just a guess made by scholars of later generations. By the year 1420, the Forbidden City was almost complete, and the emperor issued orders that the colossal Yongle Bell be completed at the same time. With this, dozens of furnaces were fired to release the molten bronze into the mold to cast the giant bell. No 
1420, the year the Forbidden City was completed, the huge bell was successfully cast, and it was named after the reign of the emperor, Yong Le. The sound that emanates from this bell is fine indeed. One knock creates an echo that lasts as long as two minutes, and the sound is very musical. Today, we know the precise percentages of the metals in the alloy. It is 80.5% bronze and 16% tin, while the remaining 3.5% contains lead, zinc, and magnesium. These ingredients, besides making the bell very strong and helping it produce a pleasant sound, enable it to withstand rust. It's hard to imagine just how many tests would have been needed to come up with the correct percentages for this alloy 500 years ago. After all these years, the bell still produces a pleasant sound. Making it required a thorough mastery of metallurgy, casting, mechanics and acoustics, so it is little wonder that in Encyclopedia Britannica, the Jung Le bell comes first in the list of the world's most famous bells. When the Forbidden City was finally completed in the year 1420, it was a man-made marvel, a testament to the numerous ingenious engineers who built it in what was still, in Europe, the Middle Ages. The Great Wall, which the Ming Dynasty had continued to build, began near the sea at Shanghai Pass in China's east and ended at Jiayu Pass in China's west. It stretched all the way from China's eastern coast to China's northwest, an area dominated by sand and wind. Most of the Great Wall was built on the tops of hills and mountains to follow the terrain, thus highlighting the shape of zigzagging mountain ranges like a huge dragon. For this reason, the Great Wall is viewed as the symbol of the Chinese nation, and together with the Egyptian pyramids and the Taj Mahal in India, it is regarded as one of the world's truly great historic engineering marvels. I think that Chinese the Yung Le Encyclopedia, compiled during the Ming Dynasty, was the largest of all the great written works compiled in ancient China. In the year 1637, Song Yingxing of the Ming Dynasty published Tian Gong Kai Wu, or Exploitation of the Works of Nature, a comprehensive book covering science and handicraft technology. Another man named Xu Guangqi wrote Nong Zhang Chuan Chu, or the Encyclopedia of Agriculture. After 30 years of extensive traveling, Xu Xiaoke published Travel Notes by Xu Xiaoke, which describes China's geology in great detail. Li Shijian, who lived in the middle of the Ming Dynasty era, wrote the voluminous Compendium of Materia Medica, held to be the most comprehensive medical book in Chinese history. The Ming Dynasty boasted a long list of established thinkers and literary men. The philosophical studies of Wang Yang Ming, for example, reflected a profound exploration of human life unmatched in any previous dynasty. The famous classical novels Journey to the West, Heroes of the Marshes, and Romance of the Three Kingdoms were all written during the Ming Dynasty, as was the famous classical play The Peony Pavilion. Crafts of all kinds went through a time of great advance during the Ming Dynasty. The long list of extraordinary achievements, including the Great Wall, the Forbidden City, and Zheng He's voyages to the Western Seas, crowned the dynasty in glory, to say nothing of the renown brought to the time by China's dreamlike silk, brocade, and porcelain, all of which charmed the entire Western world. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Ming China was the most developed country in the world. 
in terms of its craftsmanship and economy. The list of its achievements is long and extraordinary, including the strengthening of the Great Wall, the building of the Forbidden City, and Zheng He's voyages to the Western Seas. Products such as Chinese silk, brocade, and porcelain became much sought after in the rest of the world, and they still are today. Thank you for staying with us on New Frontiers and tune in again next time when we'll bring you more of our series on Chinese civilization. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Bye. -bye.